I'm sure we'll have to stand up and Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome and welcome to the No Click It Bible Study. Our topic this evening is uh, what to think and do during temptations. And uh, the first thing I'd like you to do and think is to say the prayer together. Let's uh, see if we can form a circle here. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we turn to you in your word. Please explain to us, Lord, the process that we're going through in regeneration and give us advice for how to handle what we're going through and what you would have us think, what you would have us do while we're in temptations. We thank you, Lord, for giving us this opportunity to know you and to know the path you would have us on. Amen. Amen. Thank you, friends. So, last time we were reading about all the drama of uh, Exodus 3, uh, 5 to 14, of, of going through the process of repentance, escape from hell, the details. And um, uh, one of the things that immediately happens after we go through repentance is that we come into temptation, into spiritual temptation. And so that's our topic tonight. And I wanted to have some specific sort of practical advice about what to do when we end up in that situation. See if we can see what, what uh, scripture says about this. So if you'd be willing to turn to Exodus chapter 14, and uh, we're running with a skeleton crew tonight, even our uh, uh, beloved usual readers and so forth are uh, um, elsewhere enjoying the beach and such things. And, and uh, welcome, welcome, good to see you. The, uh, so if we can turn to Exodus chapter 14, uh, those of you who were here last time, we saw uh, this intense process between Moses and Pharaoh about let my people go. It really struck me after the, uh, the Bible study last week, uh, how it's, it, you could put it very simply that there's a contest between uh, Pharaoh, who believes that the children of Israel are his people, and that they should serve him, and the Lord, who said, no, they're my people, and they should serve me. You know, so it's a very simple contest between these two claimants to, to you know, who, who really owns the people and who should they give their service to. And basically, when he keeps going in and says, let my people go, that they may serve me. You know, it goes in again and again, giving this message. And uh, the good news, friends, is that, and, and I've likened this to the process of repentance, which is the very beginning of our spiritual life. And it leads in time to the development of faith and love. Uh, it's just the bedrock of, of what we go through spiritually. And um, uh, the good news is <laughs> that uh, going through a process of repentance makes you eligible for spiritual temptation. <laughs> uh, it's very exciting. So look at Exodus chapter 14. Uh, part of the way that this Bible study works is that people have different translations and so forth, but uh, uh, I've got the old King James here in my hand. And, and one reason, when I started out, I wasn't working with the, um, with the King James, but, but to so many people, in the, in, in, uh, especially in the Bible Belt and so on, uh, as they say on the bumper stickler, if it ain't King James, it ain't Bible. And uh, so I've wanted to get familiar with this, to, to be on the same page, on the, you know, not on the same understanding, but using the same words, you know, the same verses and so on. That's one of the reasons that I, that I have this, even though as a, as a church, we're usually dealing with the New King James and a, a host of other translations as well. Uh, so you see in chapter 14 there, uh, pick up in verse 5, and it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled. And the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this that we have let Israel go from serving us? They seem to have forgotten already about the destruction of the firstborn and the absolute devastation of the nation before that. And they suddenly have second thoughts and they say, why did, and you see how it's all about serving us. You know, what the children of Israel were to them were, were their servants and why have we let them go from serving us? And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him um, and look at verse 8. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. 
And the children of Israel went out with a high hand. What does it say in your translation there at the end of that verse? Boldness. With boldness. Yes, isn't that great? With a high hand or boldness. So here they are, they have escaped after many, many generations of pleading with the Lord to be released from this captivity. Uh, they have finally gotten free and they go out with boldness. And we'll see that within two verses, Pharaoh figures out a counter move that saps all that boldness almost instantly. <laughs> So they go out with boldness or with a high hand, but the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them in camping by the sea beside Pihahiroth before Baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians mar marched after them and they were sore afraid and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Uh, so this boldness evaporated in two verses uh, that, that they were feeling when they got away because at first it seemed like okay that wasn't you know it wasn't too bad most of those plagues didn't even have to hit us and now we're free and we got out and then you see the enemy coming now this is a picture friends of the first spiritual temptation uh, that we go through you you're not eligible for spiritual temptation while you're still in hell and I, uh, and, and I want to explain this a little bit uh, while you're still in slavery to evil uh, you, you, there's lots of suffering attendant with that. Uh, so temptation is not suffering. Or, or if you had to use the word temptation, you, uh, Swedenborg would say it's a natural temptation. Uh, it, spiritual temptation is not the same as suffering. There's lots of suffering attendant with, with being a slave in Egypt. But spiritual temptation is the attack of the hells after you leave. You know, it's, it's after you leave that you get attacked. Why would you attack your own servant? If, if your servant's doing what you want your servant to do, you don't attack your servant. It's only when the servant has said, I don't want to serve you anymore. I'm going to go off and serve somebody else. Is that all right with you? And as I've said before, you know, Pharaoh didn't say, well, that's nice and give them a gold watch for their years of service. Uh, he, he, uh, uh, he comes on the attack, you know, even when it's cost him very much. Uh, he comes on the attack and so they're terrified and so this attack from hell that, that this corresponds to is the is the first temptation and they cry out to the Lord now this is interesting it's natural that you would cry out to the Lord in that situation uh, and a number of other verses we'll see today talk about that crying out uh, but anyway just hold that in your mind because there's there's a a passage just a little bit on where this gets dealt with in a somewhat different way. And they said to Moses, and this is not the last time that they're going to say words of this kind. Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore have you dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell you in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? Oh, is that what you were saying? I thought you were complaining about that slavery thing. Is that what you were? Oh, I'm sorry. I misunderstood you. I thought you were saying, I want to get out of Egypt. Now you're saying, isn't this what we said? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. <laughs> so beautiful. For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And so uh, you can see they're in extreme distress. And they're horrified. As far as they can tell, they know the outcome of the story. They're all going to get killed by Pharaoh and his armies. They're pinned in between the armies and the sea. And, uh, and Moses said unto the people, Fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. Uh, and, and this is true in, in the story. Like, when the Egyptians are dealt with, they're dealt with. They, they're, they never come back as a problem. Uh, they gain other enemies when they're wandering through the wilderness, particularly the Amalekites, but also the Canaanites. And when they enter the land, then they've got other enemies again, uh, all the, you know, the Hivites and Jebusites and, and all the Hittites and the Amorites and so forth. Um, but it's true. The Egyptians will be dealt with. And so that's a picture of the temptation is actually a purification process. Why we're allowed to go through this 
is that we went through repentance to try to get away from some evil. But now there needs to be a, a follow-up that, that purifies us and sanctifies us, and that's called temptation. So it really is a blessing of the Lord, and it really is a salvation of the Lord. Um, but it doesn't feel at all good. And uh, it's a new level of awful. You know, it's a new level that makes Egypt look good in comparison. You're like, why don't we go? Didn't we tell you we love serving the Egyptians and we wanted to stay there? Uh, verse 14, and the Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. A very important piece of temptation is that the Lord fights for us. Now listen to this. And the Lord said to Moses, wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. Um, uh, I think there's an important point here, which is that there comes a point. While we're in slavery, we cry out to the Lord, cry out to the Lord. We want relief from this situation. We're praying and we're asking for help. Part of what happens in temptation is that you reach the point at which prayer is not enough. Prayer will not carry the day. You know, the Lord says to Moses, why are you crying to me? Tell the people to go forward. This is the time when we have to take action. It's not enough. We're going to do it anyway. We will cry out to the Lord. But what this verse means is that we have to, there's a point at which we have to actually take action ourselves. And it's not, oh Lord, help us. You know, that, that doesn't carry the day. You've, there's something we've got to do to participate. It's, and, and that's a big part of the point of temptation is that we have to do something ourselves. And um, so there's a, there's a bunch of stuff in here that we don't need to read. It's all incredibly wonderful. Um, and you know that the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea, and there remained not as much as one of them at the end of verse 28. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left, and thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. And we saw last time that before this, there wasn't a great deal of belief in either Moses or the Lord. Uh, uh, you know, uh, So they've developed faith through this process. So they've been, you know, something very positive came out of that attack. But it was terrifying and nothing could really take away the terror of having this, you know, it, it, it's, it's one thing to sort of be burdened. Okay, they increased your brick load that you have to do and so forth. It's another thing to be in the crosshairs of hell. You know, like you are specifically under attack. Very unpleasant situation and yet very necessary for our spiritual lives. It's a purification. So I wanted to give you some thoughts in the, in the hopes of arming you. Uh, let's, let's write up here. Uh, what to think. Now, I've just pulled together these teachings from here and there in the, in the scriptures, and somebody else could pull together a completely different list or whatever. But this is my list of, of what to think uh, when we're in these spiritual temptations, let me say a little word about spiritual temptations. Uh, suffering is uh, is a, is a um, smorgasbord to which we are all uh, graciously invited, uh, and it's not unique to adults. It's not unique to those who've been through repentance. Children go through it. Animals go through it. You know, uh, it, uh, suffering. Uh, is sort of a ubiquitous experience. Uh, the advice I'm about to give you is, is also fine to practice uh, when you're just suffering in some other way, but the suffering of spiritual temptation, as you know, friends, is that there's something spiritual that is the sort of topic or the issue. You know, when we suffer, there's an issue. You know, it may be physical pain, or I lost my position, or this didn't work out, or I'm heartbroken over the other thing. Well, there's, there's an issue. And uh, those things may come with a spiritual temptation in them or may not. When there's a spiritual issue, which is 
the Lord seems to be completely absent. Or I don't think the Lord has the power to save me. Or I don't think I'm salvable. Or things of that nature. You know, I have no love for the neighbor. I, I don't know anything about truth. and Things like that. That's uh, what makes it a spiritual temptation. Yes? Well, I was just going to ask, how would you define a spiritual versus a natural temptation? Just... Yeah, and, and they, can, they can, I mean, the Lord is, is all about efficiency. We're only in this world for a little while. And so he'll often schedule your spiritual temptation on top of your natural temptation. You know, it's efficient. <laughs> You're already suffering. Why not also get some spiritual benefit out of it? Um, I didn't tell the difference. But it is difficult. Uh, I think that there's um, uh, there's there's a particular way uh, something that particularly happens in spiritual temptation, as we'll see in the next few passages, is that your evils and falsities get stirred up. So you see yourself in a really horrible light. I think that's one of the symptoms of spiritual temptation, it, which wouldn't necessarily happen. You know, you can go in a funk or whatever about losing your job or 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 some something else. You know, the, the financial reversal or something like that. Uh, but it's when you are just horrible in your in your own. You know, you can't stand the reek of your own evil. Uh, that that's sort of the the feeling in a spiritual temptation, uh, because it's about a, a spiritual issue. Um, could you turn good friends to the New Testament and for those of you who are new I should explain that this is a rather bold experiment we're doing where we look at the uh, Bible the whole Bible and nothing but the Bible from a Swedenborgian lens uh, that's what we're doing here so we read the Acts and Epistles and other things I might explain that uh, Swedenborg's attitude toward the Acts and Epistles is interestingly ambivalent over time there are actually passages in the Arcana that state that they are definitely not the word. And there are actually many passages in later works that state categorically that they are the word. And that they are inspired by the uh, influx of the Holy Spirit and so on. So we've got a difficult picture that we, w that we look at in looking at them. Uh, but uh, it's under the influence of those teachings that, that we look at all of this here. Can you turn to James, the epistle of James? which is up toward the book of Revelation at the very end of the book. It's right after Hebrews, if you can find that. If you've gone to Peter or the epistles of John, 1, 2, and 3, gone a little too far. If the epistle of James, uh, the first chapter deals with temptation, and we'll get back to some of these other teachings in a bit. Uh, but verses 13 and 14 seem important here. Let no man say when he is tempted... I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Uh, so one thing to, to realize, not I wouldn't call it a happy thought, uh, that it is caused by our evils and falsities. You know, in a compost pile, uh, if you have worms in the compost pile uh, or, or whatever, it's, it's the fact that there's carbon and nitrogen in there. Uh, the, the, that's what causes the process and fuels the whole thing. Uh, what causes temptation in us is that we have material that the temptation can work on. We have evils and falsities in us. And this is part of the purification process. And it heats up in there, and eventually you get nice stuff that you can put back in the garden. So, you know, uh, but it's an intense process. Uh, oh, another. So, what I'm doing here is just picking different scriptures that to me relate to temptation. And, and I have five thoughts and then five things to do while, while we're in temptation. Because it's really tough to know what to do when you're in a temptation. Uh, turn back to the Gospel of Matthew, if you would. The first of the four Gospels. So that'll be to the left in your book. And in Matthew chapter 4, we see Jesus going through these temptations. But Jesus was tempted, which is interesting. He did not sin, but he had hereditary evils and falsities in his lower self. And uh, so you know this story very well. 
He was led of the Spirit, in verse 1, into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. So when does temptation hit? It hits at the time of weakness. It tends to come when you're hungry or you're tired or you're lonely or you hadn't had enough sleep or, or, or you're angry or you're hot or something, you know. Uh, there can be a, a, a it, it, they, they get you when you're down. You know, it's like the wolves getting the, the straggling deer or elk or what, you know, the, the sickly or the ones that are, and the, you know, they get you when you're, when you're down. Uh, in Jesus's case, uh, it's very interesting that it became increasingly difficult for him to be down enough to experience temptation. And yet that was the whole reason that he was here. So he had to actually artificially keep some old raggy evil around just, just to give them something to work on because he wanted to go through this process. It's so different than not. You know, we don't want to do it. We pray not to go through it and so on. Um, and then you know that uh, here in Matthew that uh, he has this exchange. So the devil tempts him to command the stones to be made bread, and then he quotes scripture to him. And then the devil takes him and sets him on a pinnacle of the temple and says, if you're the son of God, cast yourself down. And the devil quotes scripture to him. He shall give his angels charge over you, and they'll bear you up, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. And he says, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord thy God. And then this one's very interesting to me, that the devil takes him up to a seating high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and says to him, all these things will I give you if you will fall down and worship me. Uh, I think there's sort of a core temptation there, uh, the things of power and the love of the world and, and so on and so forth. And then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall you serve. And then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Now, on the surface of it, Scripture gives us very little impression of what Jesus went through. Uh, we learn from Swedenborg that he was going through continual temptations. But you see this more in the Old Testament stories of what he was really going through on the inside. Uh, but another thought that I would put up here another kind of realization is that temptation is an attack sorry if you can't see this back there on uh, our love of self and the world when we are weak so that's what's going on you know sometimes it's helpful to know what's going on and we'll be jumping around in the scriptures a lot tonight, for which I apologize in advance. Could you turn to the right and go to the epistle to the Hebrews, which is about halfway through all the epistles on your way back to the uh, book of Revelation. It's a fairly um, large one, 12 chapters, so hopefully you can find that. And look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. This is talking about Jesus as our high priest. For we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Uh, it was very important. Part of the whole reason he came here, I'm so interested that some people believe that he was pure and not only he was pure, but his mother Mary was pure and not only she was pure. Her mother Anne, who never really was mentioned anywhere, but his mother Anne was pure. Because somebody has to be, you know, you have to get the purity in there. And, uh, and yet, actually, the whole point was that Jesus had hereditary evil and was going through temptations. Because this is how he was purified and glorified. He had to allow these things on himself. And so... In all points, tempted like as we are. You know, very, very important teaching, yet without sin. He didn't commit sin. It wasn't his own sinfulness. In our case, it's often our sin that gets us in this mess. But he was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Uh, oh, let's look at, uh, turn back to the Psalms, if you would. So there, to the left of Isaiah, back there in the Old Testament. And uh, look at Psalm 107. I like this little picture. I think it's a picture of temptation. Again, I'm jumping all over the place and pulling together different scriptures. 
but to me, it's sort of a picture. Um, what I want to say about this is that, uh, as some of you know, I'm a translator. And one of the lovely things that people say to translators is that translation is the art of failure. Another wonderful thing they say is traditore, traditore, the translator is a traitor, and so forth. But um, uh, well, temptation sounds a little like translation, because it too is the art of failure. Uh, what happens in temptation is that you get pushed to the point at which you fall into despair, and you can't handle it. Uh, this is the nature of temptation. Uh, this is part of what's going on. So by nature, and this is why I think it's so important to have a few thoughts and a few to-do lists or something, because you, 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 we're getting pushed. It's an extremely uncomfortable position, and we're pushed to the point of our powerlessness. And this was a psalm that I thought spoke to this. And it's all down in our natural self, which I think corresponds here in this passage to the sea. Look at verse 23 in Psalm 107. They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commands and raises the stormy wind, which lifts up the waves thereof. They mount up to heaven. They go down again. These are the people going up to heaven. They go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man. And they are at their wit's end. I think this is a picture of what happens when those storms assail the natural self. Uh, and everything's roiled up, you know, by this, by this attack. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he brings them out of their distresses. So there's another passage where they cry to the Lord, and, and he brings them out. He makes the storm a calm so that the waves thereof are still. Then they are glad because they be quiet. So he brings them unto their desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Interesting passage because it says that the Lord commands and raises the stormy wind. Uh, it's a very common practice in, uh, throughout Scripture that the Lord is blamed for all kinds of difficult things that happen to us, even though in James we just read that he tempts no one. He's not tempted and he doesn't tempt us. Uh, he's not the cause of this. It's caused by our, you know, it's our own lust that, that entices us. We just read there. Uh, but nevertheless, this process is good. The Lord is good and, and he brings something good out of the process. So what I would say out of this is that it's um, temptation equals a storm in our lower self. And it's a storm that we can't, we actually can't handle. It goes beyond what we are able to, to handle. Part of the point of it, uh, I might as well say right now, in my understanding of it, is that it brings us to the point at which uh, we fail and we fall. And then we find out. When we fall, because until then we're sort of doing our spiritual life, and then hell manages to get us and inflame something that's in us, and we reach the point where we just we can't fight it off anymore, and we fall toward hell, and then what happens is the Lord picks us up and delivers us, just as the psalm just said, from that storm, and what you learn in that moment is that, you know, in a way we deserve to be in hell. Uh, because of the way that we are. But the Lord, it's by the Lord's mercy that he's lifted us up. It wasn't through nothing that we did ourselves because we went through repentance and we're doing things. Uh, but it truly is the Lord's mercy and grace that saves us. And you learn that the Lord loves you, that he's closer than you thought. In that Exodus 14 that we read at the beginning, they see that the Lord was fighting for them. Uh, after they're attacked. That's when they especially, they've seen all these powerful things before, but they especially see the rescue of the Lord when they're in an in a impossibly tight spot and he rescues them uh, when they couldn't possibly have saved themselves. And they did have to go forward. They, there was something they had to do themselves, but it was obviously the Lord, obviously the Lord who just plain rescued them. Uh, two more points here. 
I've got a couple of scriptures on this. If you can turn to the right to Isaiah, it comes after Ecclesiastes and a few other things there. Uh, turn to Isaiah. Isaiah's the biggest thing in the whole book, and it's right about in the center. And look at Isaiah chapter 24, if you will, uh, because another point here that I want to make is that uh, it equals being emptied out. There's an emptying process. And those of you who, who know multisyllabic words uh, know that in some of the old translations, the writings is referred to as exinonition. And not only in the writings, but it's in the whole Christian tradition, this idea of, or kenosis is another word, it's the being emptied out of, of the lower self. Uh, this, is, this is a function of it. And it, it's not emptied out like someone just took stuff out of your attic in your basement while you were off at work. Uh, you see it all come through the living room <laughs> and the dining room. You know, uh, we, we're under attack when we're in this state. And you see it all coming up and out. Uh, Isaiah 24, verses 1 to 4, and, and it has to do with being humble. That's another important thing, that the lower self is humble. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down. That's certainly how you feel when you're going through spiritual temptation. And scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. And it shall be, as with the people, so with the priest. As with the servant, so with his master. As with the maid, so with her mistress. As with the buyer, so with the seller. As with the lender, so with the borrower. As with the taker of usury, so with the giver of usury to him. The land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled. For the Lord hath spoken this word. And the earth mourneth and fadeth away. The world languisheth and fadeth away. The haughty people of the earth do languish. One of the things that happens in temptations is that we get humbled. Being emptied out and, and humbled. Uh, oh, let's look at another emptying passage. Jeremiah. So turn to the right. Uh, the next uh, prophet is Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah 5, verses 15 to 18. Another important thing to realize, um, actually this kind of comes under another heading here. It, it, it fits both. Uh, did I even put that in the right place? Yeah, let's just read it now anyway, uh, wherever it belongs. In verse 15. The Lord says, Lo, I will bring a nation upon you from far, O house of Israel, says the Lord. It is a mighty nation. It is an ancient nation, a nation whose language thou knowest not, neither understandest what they say. Their quiver is as an open sepulcher. They are all mighty men. And they shall eat up your harvest and your bread, which your sons and your daughters should eat. They, they consume all this stuff in the lower self in this emptying out process. They shall eat up thy flocks and thy herds. They shall eat up thy vines and thy fig trees. They shall impoverish thy fenced cities wherein thou trustest with the sword. Nevertheless, in those days, says the Lord, I will not make a full end with you. It's going to be an emptying out. And it will feel like you're being killed. Uh, you know, I think the proper expression is being killed to death. Uh, but... You're not, actually. The Lord's, you no, know, you're being emptied out. It feels like you're being killed. You're being emptied out, and all the stuff is being taken away from you. It's actually a purification process, but very intense. Ah, let's read one more emptying out. See if you can find, good friends, the book of Nahum. Okay, so turn to the right. It's in the Minor Prophets. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum. So it's the seventh of them. It's a tiny little thing. Blink and you miss it. And uh, we're looking for Nahum chapter 2. Verses 1 and 2. Again, I think this is about temptation. He that dasheth, dasheth in pieces is come up before thy face. Keep the munition. Watch the way. Make your loins strong, fortify your power mightily. For the Lord has turned away the excellency of Jacob as the excellency of Israel. 
for the empty ears. I don't know what it is in your translation, but the empty ears have emptied them out and marred their vine branches. What do you have in your translation there? Empty ears. Empty ears and emptied out. Destroyers. Destroyers. Although it says um, the Lord will restore the excellence of Jacob in this translation. Interesting. Yeah, he has, here he's turned it away. But the emptiers have emptied them out. And they're, and they're, both, they're, they're both accurate. Um, so it's a being emptied out. And the fifth point uh, is one that we already saw there. Uh, not to death. You know, it will feel at times. I mean, look what the children of Israel said. Have you brought us out here in the world? Were there not enough graves in Egypt? Was that the problem? You didn't have enough space to bury over a million people, so you brought us out here so there'd be lots of space to bury us all. Is that what we're doing? Uh, but Scripture says, no, it's not about you being killed. It's not to death. Let's look at some passages on this, just a few. Can you turn all the way back, friends, to Leviticus? You have the five books of Moses at the beginning of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. And back in Le Leviticus chapter 26, the Lord talks about a time when, when the children of Israel will be, um, when they'll be in the land of their enemies. The land of their enemies. It's in this battle, this spiritual warfare. It's about temptation. So chapter 26, verse 44. And yet for all that, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, neither will I abhor them, to destroy them utterly and to break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. But I will for their sakes remember the covenant of their ancestors whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the heathen, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. Ultimately, the function of temptation is to get to be the Lord's people. You know, that, that's what the Lord is trying to head towards. So, so he says, I'm not going to destroy you utterly. It's going to feel like you're being killed, but this is not actually utter destruction for you. And all the rest are in the Psalms. So turn to the right, and uh, you get to the Psalms roughly in the middle of the book there. And we have four passages in here, just briefly, that have to do with this. I think they're very, very beautiful. Psalm 34. The teaching is that the Lord is actually very close to us when we're in temptations, but it is certainly the case that he feels entirely absent. And we feel very much on our own when we're in that situation. Psalm 34, verses 18 and 19. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saves such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Uh, I thought that was, that was beautiful. Um, turn to Psalm 37. It's another little, these are all little glimpses of what temptation is. Psalm 37, verses 23 and 24. The steps of a good man, and it does not mean, and not a good woman. It's always included here. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. That's what we're talking about here. So you fall. It doesn't say you're not going to fall. You will fall. Because when we get attacked in this situation, we don't have, you know, we have these evils and falsities that bring us down. So we will fall. But not utterly cast down. You know, because the Lord upholds us with his hand. Uh, turn to Psalm 118. Oh, this is another good one. 
Psalm 118, verses 17 and 18. I don't know what it says in yours. I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me sore, but he has not given me over unto death. And there's another one. It's chastened me sore. Like, oh, I felt that one. You know? It says in Revelation 3.19, As many as he loves, he rebukes and chastens. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. It's, it's his love that's doing this. He's chastened me sore, but he hasn't given me over to death. And in Psalm 119, the very next one, verse 71, in this largest of all psalms, listen to that. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Now that's a very interesting phrase right there. Because, uh, again, there's a lot of thought in our world that you get faith or you get understanding at the very beginning of your Christian experience or something. But this says that it's through affliction that you finally learn, learn the Lord's statutes. It's good for me. Yeah, and it's in retrospect. You don't, you know, when you're going through it, it's not a happy experience. But after the f fact, you can look back and you say, it's good for me that I've been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Actually, that was, in retrospect, a better process than it felt like when I was going through it. All right. Um, now, uh, what I want to do on the other side. So, what I tried to present here is just, um, these are thoughts. Now, I lay these out, but when you're actually in a spiritual temptation, uh, even these simple thoughts are extremely difficult to think. Um, uh, it's amazing how we can have a great game plan, uh, but as they say, there's another team on the field, and uh, <laughs> they, can, they can thwart what we're thinking. But these are things, if you can possibly try to think these, uh, that actually this is caused by our own evils and falsities. It's attack on our love of self of the world when we're weak. The storm in our lower self, we're being emptied out and it's not going to kill us. It's actually a purification process that we're going through. And so that, that's what's going on, on here. Uh, now I want to write up here what to do. Uh, I just pulled together again, I just pulled together some scriptures, but I came up with five sort of things that I think um, will hopefully be helpful. It's extremely difficult, I find it extremely difficult to know what to do uh, when, when under assault. But here are some, some things that might be helpful. Uh, let's look at Exodus, so all the way back to the second book of the Old Testament. Oh, I think there's so much richness in here. I just know I'm not going to do justice to it. Uh, Exodus 17. This is shortly after the Exodus 14 that we just read before. And it's another major assault that happens to them when they're in the wilderness. It's an attack from the Amalekites. Ooh, the Amalekites. <laughs> and they correspond to falsity that, that gets you, that preys on you when, when you're weak. And they're like an ancient enemy of the people. Uh, verse 8, Exodus 17, verse 8. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us out men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. Familiar story, right? So jo Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up on the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand, held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Now what this corresponds to is that when the temptation is going on and we're under assault, we're winning as long as we're turning our, our thoughts uh, to the Lord. As, as long as we're focused on love of the Lord and love of the neighbor, we win. Uh, but when we get exhausted and we're looking down at ourselves 
and our own issues of our self-image or self-centeredness or worldliness or whatever, then Amalek wins. The Lord wins, Amalek wins. The Lord wins, Amalek wins. So, and Moses is getting exhausted. What's he going to do? But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. Hmm, I wonder what that stone is. Hmm, what would be a stone-like thing that he would sit on? The Word of God, maybe? He sat on the Word, so his hands are heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. So one piece of advice is sit on the Word. <laughs> Not physically, I don't think that'll help you much, but, uh, <laughs> but meaning that... Um, there can be scriptures. They might be very simple scriptures. Uh, but, uh, you know, if, if you're uh, tempted to kill yourself or somebody else or something like that, just, you know, thou shalt not kill. Or, or uh, they can be very fundamental things. But if you're just sitting on the word, you know, sitting, sitting on the word, uh, just, just stay there. Stay glued to that. You know, that's one way to, to, to keep yourself together during the battle and Aaron and her stay, stayed up his hands the one on the one side and the other on the other side and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun and Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword and uh, I can't demonstrate it to you from the literal sense of scripture but what uh, Aaron and her mean Moses is a very high kind of spiritual truth and he serves you for a while but he just, you know, he's feeling the weight of the battle. You need sort of medium truth and external truth, uh, moral truth, and even kind of a civil truth, uh, very external principles. Like sometimes it's too much to think about, well, am I blah, 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 blah. It's just, well, don't hurt people or, you know, something very external and basic that can help you focus in the right direction and not succumb uh, when the battle's going on. So sitting on the word, uh, I don't know how to express this succinctly. Maybe I'll just say, and follow basic rules. They're very helpful, really basic rules, like just loving the neighbor, you know, even though you, you feel horrible or, or whatever. Just try, you know, you, you're not feeling it, you're not feeling the love or anything like that. You're under assault. But just still sit on the word and follow the really basic rules. You know, uh, that, that's how they're able to prevail. Uh, in a very related way, uh, I'll say a fight to do good and think truth. And again, apologies if there's not visible from the back of the room there. Uh, but part of the point is that uh, it's beyond the point at which we can just cry to the Lord and say, Lord, help us, we're under attack. Lord, please help us. Uh, the whole point is we've got to pick sides. See, um, you know, to use that other analogy, Moses and Pharaoh are, are locked in a battle. We have to choose, choose that this day whom, whom you shall serve. We, we have to take sides in the battle. It's not enough just to cry out to the Lord. We have to show through our fighting. By the way, our fighting will be ridiculous. It'll be like a little children's plastic arrow with a little rubber suction cup on the end. Beaming, you know, with a rubber band, you know, shooting it at hell. Uh, but, uh, but we still have to take a stand. You know, we still have to go out there. Another example that has occurred to me is, is David uh, battling Goliath. You know, like physically, it, he, he can't possibly win the battle. But he's got just a few stones, a uh, few truths, a few, uh, few good things that he can throw at him in that situation. And, and you, ha you have to fight. Um, uh, I don't know whether you'll see these passages the way I do, but let's just try them anyway. Can you turn back, good friends, to the Epistle of James, which is after the Hebrews in the in the New Testament epistles, getting toward the end of the book there. Hmm. 
This whole chapter is about temptation. James chapter 1, I recommend it to you. And uh, so it's been talking, those verses we just read above in 13 and 14 is what we read before, about how when we're tempted and so forth. And then look just right down below in verse 19. Here's some advice on what to do. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, in this grand old translation, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now, that's difficult teaching, but, but the gist of it, I think, is that in temptation, we need to fight on the side of, of good and truth. You know, we have to lay apart the filthiness and superfluity and naughtiness and so on. We need to be meek, and uh, we need to really come to terms with what we are. We look in the mirror, don't just turn away, but actually look at, at what you are but continue in that perfect law of, of liberty, and then we'll be, we'll be blessed in our deeds. Uh, turn back to the Gospel of Matthew. We're jumping all over the place tonight. Sometimes we, repeat, we read very sequentially, and sometimes we jump all over. Matthew chapter 6. I think this is related. You're most welcome to disagree with me. But I think this is related. Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 to 18. It's about when you fast. See, this fasting, I think, relates also to this, uh, you're being emptied out. I, I think the fasting may relate to that. I may be way off. Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. But verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. Interesting advice. I think part of this is just a very practical sense that when you're going through it, don't visit your hell on everybody else, you know. And you look at the example of Jesus, I mean, I am just amazed. You know, there's one story that I preached on once where he... Uh, Jesus uh, just found out that John the Baptist was beheaded. Wonderful news. And then he goes out all night, and he's praying all night by himself. And then he comes back in the morning, and all the people are looking for him. And he doesn't say, oh, I'm exhausted. I've been up all night. Are you kidding me? And my best friend, was just, you know, oh, my cousin got his head chopped off, and the whole thing's not going very well or something. You know, he just has compassion on the multitudes, and he heals them. I never hear Jesus complaining. I just never hear him complaining. And he's going through temptations constantly, and I never hear him complaining. You know? He's anointing his head, he's washing his face, and just presenting the, the putting the best foot forward. And the anointing has to do with oil, the anointing on the head, and washing the face has to do with truth. You know, so the love and truth. This is why I put it under the category of fighting to do what's good and to think what is true. Even when you feel like hell, you know, even when you're fasting and you're going through deprivation and you feel awful, don't visit it on, on other people. Fight to keep doing good and thinking truth, even in that difficult state. It's important. It, this is all very hard teaching. I'm not saying it's not. It's very hard teaching. Can I just ask? Yes. So when we're not making others feel miserable, just because we feel miserable, but on the other hand, I think it's like a psychology that's right. So sort of trying harder so other people aren't miserable. It can't help but have an effect. It does. I, I think it's true. It does have a siphoning effect and gets you into the thing that's important. The important thing is not your misery. The important thing is our people being served. Right. And that's what the Lord is doing there with the compassion on the multitude. That's a great comment. And I think it does siphon in that good. You know, it, it conquers for the side of good even when you're in that temptation. Um, oh, some more really, really hard teaching. Okay. Uh, pray 
for your attackers. Oh, man, I don't like this teaching. <laughs> oh, that's hard. Let's look at Luke chapter 6, okay? So from Matthew, we go through Mark to Luke there. Luke chapter 6, pick up at verse 27. But I say unto you which hear, now that's very interesting, <laughs> like this, uh, this teaching is not uh, kindergarten level, this is uh, difficult stuff. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other, and him that taketh away thy cloak, Forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asks of thee, and of him that takes away thy goods, ask them not again, as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. Um, I, I find that extremely difficult teaching. I find that difficult teaching when you're just talking about two people, when you feel wronged by another human being or something like that. Very hard to pray for those people. Uh, sometimes you even have to pray for your married partner and things like that. It's very annoying. Um, and uh, very, very difficult teaching, but so good for the heart. You know, so good for the heart to wish blessings, uh, to wish the best on, on someone else. And over time, it can siphon in a, a, a better feeling. And I have had a remarkable experience once with this when I, nothing could get me out of this spiritual fog. In that state of spiritual fog, I had actually come to the point where I knew in my heart there was no God, there was no point in going on. Uh, it, I was totally fogged in in my spirit. Uh, there, there was just nothing mattered. There was nothing but fog and, and mud and so forth. And for some reason, I don't know why, I was blessed to pray for the evil spirits who were with me. And the thought that I was blessed to think was, wow, I'm having this feeling now, but these people look at life this way all the time. Mm, Jesus, you know. And as soon as I prayed for the evil spirits who were attacking me, it, it cleared up. I could, I could, you know, I can't describe it to you, but in my spirit, the whole thing just melted away as soon as I prayed for the attackers. This really remarkable experience. So again, very hard to do. It's hard in that state to even think anything. I mean, only the Lord can give you a thought like that. Uh, but, but it can have a remarkably positive effect. Uh, uh, shall we have another hard teaching? Let's have another one, shall we? <laughs> Thank the Lord. Oh, yes. Oh, this is hard teaching. You can't do it from a state of like you don't feel it at all. You know, like nothing is further. You hate what you're going through. You're really upset. Thanking the Lord is so important. Uh, can you turn to the Old Testament, good friends, and uh, the book of Daniel, which is not that far into the Old Testament, actually, right after those minor prophets. If you get to Ezekiel, you've gone too far. Very struck by this story of Daniel. Here's a time when Daniel was under attack. There were 120 princes of the kingdom, and there were three presidents, and Daniel was the first. So you have three highest governors, and then 120 other governors in the land at the time where Daniel was in captivity. And the other 122 gang up on him and plot in order to kill him. This is Daniel chapter 6. And they sought occasion against Daniel, and they could find no occasion for fault inasmuch as he was faithful. So they thought the only way they could get him was through the law of his God. So they made this decree that anyone who didn't worship, uh, you know, would be thrown into the den of lions. And King Darius signed the writing and the decree. So the whole government has amassed against Daniel. He's the chief one and his other two presidents and the other 120 satraps or governors, whatever you want to call them, are arrayed against him. And how does he react? Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, which was his death warrant, he went into his house 
and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Now he had a habit of that, and that was a good habit to have. He went up three times a day and prayed and gave thanks. Was he really grateful? Text doesn't say. But he said, thank you, Lord. The entire government is arrayed against me. I'm looking forward to the mouths of the lions when my body's chewed up and the bones are all broken by their angry teeth. And uh, thank you, Lord. Uh, life is good. Uh, you know, whatever you're doing, it's a good thing. And I, you know, or whatever. I don't know what he said. But somehow he managed to say thank you. Before there was any solution to the problem. Way before there was any solution to the problem. He said thank you. All right. Yes. What makes it difficult? Yes, that's what makes it difficult. And I think it's so important to do it anyway. I think it's so important to, to persevere with it. And sometimes, again, like you said before, it can cause a siphoning effect where you start to feel a little bit like at least an hour later or something, you start to feel like, yeah, actually, you know, it probably is, it is, you know, something's going to be all right or something's going to work out. Uh, but at the time, it feels totally. It, it does feel hypocritical. And I think that's what's so interesting is that part of what's going on in temptation is that it's when you move in a religious or spiritual direction when there is no benefit, you know, when you don't feel it, when it's all a lie, and when you feel horrible and there's no God and it's pointless, and you still do it. That really counts. Because floating along, you know, having the Lord just pour love into your heart and then you happily, you know, radiate thanksgiving and joy, uh, that's a great state to be in. But it's kind of easy when that's all, you know, when it's hard is, is when you're being dogged, when you're at sea and you're staggering like a drunken man to and fro and the waves are carrying you up and down. And to thank the Lord in that state and say, thank you, Lord, for your mighty works. Uh, that's, that's really challenging. I heard about a woman a uh, very religious woman, actually part of the church down in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, their, their new church, Church of Truth group down there, who got in a car accident, terrible accident. The, car, the, the, the uh, vehicle rolled th three times just sideways, an SUV. And as she was rolling through the air, what she was saying was, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. She's rolling through the air. Very impressive. Uh, <laughs> uh, does the thank you count if it's sarcastic? <laughs> yeah. I do that. Yeah, yeah. I think it's still it's still, you know. <laughs> now, if it's totally angry, well it's still it's still the right thing, you know, it's still the right thing to say. But it's a good case of fake it till you make it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's a perfect case. And I think that's exactly what we have to do. All of this is stuff that doesn't come naturally when we're in that state, and that's the whole point is that we have to really try it with tremendous effort. Tremendous effort in that state. Uh, here's another example. Turn to the right to Jonah. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. So it's the fifth one in. If you get to Micah, you've gone too far. Another little prophet there. And Jonah, you remember, was called by the Lord to do something. And he didn't want to do it. And he got in a boat headed in the opposite direction. And the storm blew up. Hmm, wonder what that storm corresponds to. And they had to throw him overboard, and he went down into the, into the ocean and was swallowed up by a great fish that we usually call a, a whale. And then and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. That's the end of chapter 1. And then in chapter 2, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly, and said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Past tense. He heard me. Where's Jonah? in the belly of the whale under the water. Problem solved? Problem majorly not solved. He's still under the water in the belly of a whale with no possible sense of how to get out there. And yet he's using the past tense. He heard me. I prayed to the Lord and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and you heard my voice. For you had cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed about me. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. And then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again.
toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. A detail that I absolutely love. I just relate to this. The weeds were wrapped about my head. Now that is a picture to me of the terrible thoughts that you have when you're in that state. The weeds are wrapped around your head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. Past tense again. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to thee, to thy holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. There's the punchline. That's what he figures out. That's what those other sailors figured out in the storm. Salvation is of the Lord. Oh, I can't save myself. I can't save myself. What am I going to do? Punch a hole in the whale? Swim up to the surface? Find the land? You know, it's not going to be by my own strength that I get out of here. And what he says in the belly of the whale is, thank you, Lord, for getting me out of this situation. And then... The Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah under the dry land. He got out after he said thank you. So thank the Lord in both of those stories. They thank you before you get, thank you, Lord, before you get out. And it seems to play a role in getting you out of the nasty situation. And last but not least, you're probably already thinking it the worst of all. Rejoice and leap for joy. <laughs> now, is that tough teaching? Tough teaching. All right, turn back to James. I'm sorry to do this to you, friends, but uh, this is the way I've had to do it. After the Hebrews in the New, New Testament, the epistles there, right after the Hebrews comes James, and we're looking at chapter 1 again. And look at verse 2 right there. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. There it is. Count it all joy. James chapter 1. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Count it all joy. Uh, look also... Uh, turn back to Luke, to the left, okay? To the Gospel of Luke. Specifically where this phrase comes from. We're going back to Luke chapter 6 again. Jumping all over the place. You're very good sports. Luke chapter 6, verses 21 to 23. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner did their fathers treat the prophets. An interesting phrase that I've thought about a lot. Um, rejoice and leap for joy because this is the same way they treated the prophets. The prophets got the same treatment. So you're in good, you're in good company. Rejoice and leap for joy. I want to tell you rather a mystical thought that I've had about this. Uh, I find this, this teaching absolutely impossible to practice. Like, I, I can't rejoice in that state. I just absolutely cannot. Uh, but sometimes I do physically jump up and down. <laughs> and uh, physically jumping up and down is extremely difficult in that state. And it doesn't seem to lead to joy, but it makes me feel like an idiot. <laughs> And then I start to laugh, and a sense of humor comes in. And then somewhere down the road, I start to get into a better state. Uh, but I, ha I have tried that physically. Leap. That's a very, very hard thing to do. And the thing that came to me recently uh, was that you leap for joy. Uh, you're leaping in the direction of joy. Like, you're not necessarily going to get there, but you leap for joy. And the reason you need to lift your feet is that that's what the hell's attack. They attack the outer self. 
So getting the feet up, they're, they're attacking your feet. It's a snake, you know? It's coming at your feet. So if you can get your feet up, spiritually speaking, you know, if you can get your outer self, leap for joy and try to get those feet up because hell is coming at your feet. That's one reason that it talks about leaping for joy. So leap in the direction of joy. You may not get there, but leap and pick your feet up while you're leaping, you know, because the, the feet are what they want to attack. And can you turn to the Old Testament uh, just into those minor prophets right after Matthew as you go to the left? We're looking for Habakkuk. Okay, it comes right after Nahum, which is not helpful, and right before Zephaniah, which is also not helpful. Um, but it's like the, what is it, the eighth of the minor prophets, right before Zephaniah there, Habakkuk. Habakkuk is great, because Habakkuk is only three chapters long, and Habakkuk complains bitterly about all the evil that's going on. Just bitterly complaining about all the bad stuff that's going on. It's terrible, there's no righteousness, there's no justice, everything's bad and wrong and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and then at the end of this wonderful three chapters, oh, let's pick it up at, um, oh, it's too great. Verse 15, Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 15. You walked through the sea with your horses, through the heap of great waters. Hmm, where have we heard that before? Walking through the sea. Exodus 14. When I heard, my belly trembled. My lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered into my bones. And I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up unto the people, he will invade them with his troops. And then listen to this little refrain at the end here. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, I mean, I'd much rather have a fig tree and I'd much rather have it blossom and I'd much rather have fruit. But although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. Although the labor of the olive shall fail and the fields shall yield no food and the flock shall be cut off from the fold and there shall be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. It's beautiful. There's no good. There's no truth. The whole thing's shot. There's no animals, no fruit, no vines, nothing. The whole thing's shot. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. It's got the same spirit to me as Daniel getting down on his knees and saying, Thank you, Lord. The whole government's arrayed against me. You know? And the same spirit as Jonah. Well, I'm down here in the belly of a whale with weeds wrapped around my head at the bottom of the ocean, miles from the shore. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Difficult teaching, but rejoice in that day and leap for joy. And uh, so to sum those up, Sitting on the word, and to me that means like a good thing we can do to ourselves when we're not in temptation is to memorize some scriptures and things like that. So we have this committed to memory. So it sometimes helps me just to say, uh, sometimes I get attacked by fear and I'll just chant to myself, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And say that for about half an hour, and it starts to get rid of the fear. It takes a while. Uh, that is from, what is that, 2 Timothy 1 verse 7? I'm just making it up. Uh, let's see here. Let's see. That's a good one. Second Timothy one verse seven. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. There it is. Second Timothy one verse seven. And uh, so having a few of these scriptures sort of committed to memory that can help you in that situation. So you can sit on the word and then just following basic rules of like, OK, today I will not shoot anyone. 
today I will not, you know, like sometimes, I don't know how it is for you. I'm, I'm, the reason I'm at the front of the room is that I need this more than anybody in here. But, uh, uh, you know, sometimes crazy stuff goes through my head. And uh, so sticking to really basic rules, you know, just base, well, don't do that. That would be harmful. Put the knife down. All right, good. And uh, follow basic rules. Fighting to do good and think truth. And sometimes what I picture, lately I've been trying this, so picturing where there are garbage cans out, outside the window of my room and uh, a ways up the yard. And I'll picture just pushing the evil spirits up to the garbage. I'll just picture just pushing, out, 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 out. Go, 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 out. Now push them out. Push them up to the garbage. You know, just get them out. Um, in some sense, this has helped me a lot to realize, oh, what I'm supposed to do is I'm supposed to fight. I'm supposed to take sides here and I'm supposed to fight. It will be useless. It'll be my little rubber band with a little boing. You know, go away, you bad man. Boing. You know, that's about what my, the amount of power I have to fight off hell in that situation because you're very aware that you're helpless. But it seems to really have a good effect where an hour or two later or something, I'm starting to come out of the state and, and things get better. And a beautiful teaching is that the Lord comes with consolation afterwards. What happens in Exodus 15 is that everybody dances and sings on the shore. You know, it's a rejoicing because there's a liberation from hell. And I've just found by a couple of repetitions that this really does reduce the amount of evil and falsity. Like the Lord can bring you into a different state. This is how he sanctifies us and purifies us. Feels horrible. Feels like something's gone horribly wrong. Feels like we're at our most unsalvable when this is going on. But it actually is leading in a good direction. Our last scripture of the evening, good friends, is turn back to uh, 1 Corinthians. Chapter 10. Can you find that? It's right after the Romans. It's to the right of the Romans. First and Second Corinthians there. First Corinthians chapter 10. This is Paul's epistle to Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above what you are able but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Now, the Lord's idea of what we can bear, like if you'd said to Jonah, on your vacation in Tarshish, how about spending some quality time in the belly of a whale at the bottom of the ocean? You know, his idea of what he could handle and the Lord's idea of what he could handle is quite different. Uh, by definition, temptation is something we can't handle. That's why we stagger to and fro like a drunken man and all that, you know, because the, the, our lower self is going crazy. But it didn't say you won't go through temptations and it didn't say it'll be easy or anything like that. But it said that the Lord won't tempt you above what you're actually able to bear. It doesn't mean you automatically succeed in temptation either. There's a choice in there. But will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear. And so what I'm hoping to be talking about tonight is some ways to escape. It's very hard to find the door when you're in there. But these are some ways, some very difficult practices. But to pray for your attackers, to thank the Lord, rejoice and leap for joy, and so on. And to have this understanding. Oh, like it's helpful sometimes just to think, Oh, I'm under assault. That's why my mind is going crazy. And it's amazing how they actually, the evil spirits actually inflame your, your lusts and your falsities and so forth. So they'll, and, and they accuse you. It's very much the old trick. Like it's something that is in us. But they will inflame it much worse than it actually is and then accuse you of it. Uh, that's part of how they work. And that's part of the, it's sort of a homeopathic, it gets worse before it gets better type of a cure. And, um, uh, and when you're in that inflamed state, you just can't believe what's going through your head. Like, I can't believe this is going through my head. You know, it, it's crazy. Um, but having an understanding, oh, I think I'm being inflamed by evil spirits. I think I'm actually in temptation right now. I think this is what's going on, and this is what I should do about it. You know, this should be my understanding. It's a storm in my lower self. I'm being emptied out. It's not going to kill me. 
and here's what I should do. Uh, and, it, and I say these things not as a one, two, three, four, five, you know, do this, and then if that doesn't work, do that. Uh, just if you're blessed to think of any of these things when you're in temptation, that's a, a big bonus. Uh, and I really think they're all the same thing again and again and again. You know, uh, they're, they're not five things. Uh, uh, David goes into his fight with Goliath with five smooth stones. It only takes one to kill Goliath. Uh, uh, but he has to fling it. You know, he has to do something with it. He has to fling it at, at, at the giant uh, in, in order to stop the temptation. And we find out through the long run uh, that the Lord is good. So that's my teaching tonight uh, on what to think and what to do during temptations. Anybody have any further questions or thoughts? Yes. Um, I'm wondering if, if you go, if you stop this process after you die or if it continues to eternity or what? Great question. My understanding is that uh, it uh, can continue in the world of spirits and it's very intense in the world of spirits because here we just think I'm having a bad day, but you get in your car and you drive from A to B. But in the spiritual world, you're actually seeing all this. You know, I think it's more intense there. Uh, but uh, there is a day when the temptations come to an end, when they've done their work. And before we go to heaven, they will be through with us and we won't even be temptable anymore. We get to the point where we, we cannot be tempted. Uh, the angels cannot be tempted. They're not the least bit tempted. You know, they, it's impossible for them to do evil. They still have some of this stuff in their hereditary selves, and they sink down sometimes. No more temptation. That's part of the, when it says that we uh, have a rest from our labors after death. That's part of what it's talking about, is the labors are the temptations, and we have a labor from temptations uh, eventually uh, after we die. So it doesn't go on to eternity. Which is very, very good news. And, and uh, we, there's, there may be assaults from outside. You know, I mean, hell may attack from outside. But in terms of whether our heart is hooked by it or not, it's no, you know, we made our choice and we're no longer hooked by it. The Lord purified us, turned us into an angel, and, and uh, the, the fighting does come to an end. It, it is a good reason not to go through regeneration. You know, it's a, it's a very compelling reason not to bother going through regeneration because temptations are horrible. Now, I can totally understand anybody who says, well, oh, no, I don't want to go through that. But unfortunately, sorry, wish we had another religion, but we don't. This is the religion. Uh, this is what we go through. This is how we get purified. It's, uh, it's an important part of the process. And Jesus went through it. He went through it big time in a much bigger way than we do. Uh, Vera, and then Curtis. Um, I read and you said um, temptation is an is that a love always of something evil, or is it sometimes a love of something good? Oh, I think it's generally a love of something good. Uh, how the attack works is by inflaming the opposite. Uh, you know, so if there's an opposite, if, if you have two things sitting in you where you love the Lord, but there's also self-centeredness or something like that, they'll attack the self-centeredness and promote that. But the, the thing they're attacking is your... They're attacking because you left Egypt. So you have, you have something good in you. You know, you've, you've done some repentance. The Lord is developing love and faith in you. That's why they attack. And sometimes the attack is on true thoughts, and they'll come with falsities. Sometimes it's an attack on the more severe or an attack on your heart, uh, where they go after the very core uh, of you. Uh, but they, the weapons they use is to in, give you a sort of an inflammation of the lower self or so it's, it's part of how the, how the attack works as I understand yeah. Curtis I uh, would like to say that I think it often centers around um, uh, a good love because that is where you can induce fear is that this thing is going to be lost you know or this yeah. thing is going to be damaged like what it is is like okay like the, the potential comfort of God and that that, that doesn't exist you know or uh, you know, any kind of thing like uh, uh, conjugal love, these kinds of things. Like, you know, that you have to have something that they can induce fear around. Um, and I, I would, was what I was going to ask is, can could you? I think it's important if we're talking about temptation to talk sort of more about the 
the term and what it means, because the word can sort of call up, in, like Jiminy Cricket is there, and he's like, don't steal that candy bar. But yeah, um, right, right. Like as we were talking about before, a swing board describes the temptations, how you experience them, is not like, oh, I really want to steal this, but I'm not going to do it. You know, I'm going to look at it. It's, you yeah. experience them as pain. Like yeah. temptation is pain. And you were talking about how there That's is right. like 10 different kinds or something like that, organizations right. that he had described, and only one of them is actually has to do with uh, a desire to do something evil. The rest are, are just different forms of anxiety and pain that we feel. And to me, that's that's really important because this is really freeing. This idea that when you're in trouble, don't worry about it. God's going to take care of it. But you can think, oh well, you know, I'm I'm afraid and I'm hurting because it's a good thing. But uh, you know, it's it's not it's not having to do with me resisting something. So this is just my own problem. You know, so yeah, so I think you have anything. That, that's a great on. great comment. Thank you. Yeah, the the term. Temptation can be misleading. Uh, in some of your translations, you may have seen the word test in there. Uh, the root uh, concept in the Greek and the, and the Latin um, is of uh, trial. It's a trying experience. And so it has an element of a test in it, but it's not simply a frivolous test. It's really that you're, you know, you, sometimes we say, I'm really being tested today, or my faith is really being tested, or, or something like that, uh, which is very different. There's a tiny, as you say, sometimes there's an element of I'm tempted to do this or, or something. It, it's not about, ooh, I wish I could eat that chocolate. You know, that's a very happy experience compared to what we're talking about. You know, temptations uh, are an assault from the hells, an answering defense on the part of heaven, and the angels come, come back on the other side. The, the thing is that our head is just like three quarters of the way down where the evil spirits are. So everything we, most of the noise we hear is the evil spirits attacking because they're very, very loud. Occasionally you'll get a quiet thing that'll just say some quiet, sensible, you know, in a little split second in between the other noise. It'll say some little truth that'll just comfort you, a little drop of honey or something that keeps you going in it. So it's, we experience it very unequally because we're so much down here instead of up there with the angels. But we're actually in this, in this battle and then we're trying to take sides and push. And most of it is a very painful, just being in it is painful just because it's painful. You know, it's, it's, it's really unpleasant to be attacked. Uh, it, it's, uh, the whole thing just feels horrible and you can't wait until it's done. Yeah. So it has very little in common with... Um, I'd love some ice cream. I really shouldn't, but yeah. you know that's that's has very little to to do with it. So, so there are some enticements like that will come into it, but but that that's the core of it is this battle between hell and hell is attacking you because you left, you know, uh, and so you don't get this fun until after you've gone through some repentance. Yeah, because you're getting you're getting shrapnel, like you're getting collateral damage, and there's a there's a sculpture. In uh, Glencairn, in the like, yeah. church exhibit, where it's a per it's inspired by Swedenborg's stuff. It's a person, um, and there's two, you know, two devils are tugging on, like yeah. grabbing their leg, grabbing their arm, tugging on them downwards, and two angels are grabbing their upper body and pulling them up. That's right. And that's a picture of, of temptation, you know, and like that. That's right. Know, that the evils in us are how the hell's can grab, but it's not like we're pushing the angels away. You know, it's like we're getting stretched. It's, it's yeah. Not pleasant. And the way that we, what we do in that situation, you know, which way we try to go. Yeah. Because uh, uh, we're already headed in a heavenward direction when this starts to happen. It can, if, if we decide to go with hell, it can shut off our regeneration. But, but most of the time, uh, it's not going to, that would still be our choice. Uh, and most of the time, it's people who are already have, headed in the heavenward direction. And it just helps to further you along the way. And the other good news is that the whole time, the 40 years that they're wandering in the wilderness, uh, the children of Israel, um, there are only like three of these attacks or something. Uh, uh, it doesn't, it's not, with the Lord it was continual. But with us, you know, you'll go a long while and then boom, you'll get another one and then, you know, you go a long while. So it's not as though your life just becomes relentless pain and suffering as a result of making the horrendous mistake of going through some repentance. Uh, actually a lot gets positive and then occasionally you fight but you get more and more clear on the fact that oh well I'm fighting and actually last time I went through this 
it actually went well and I felt better afterwards. I actually felt more peace in my heart and I felt closer to the Lord and you know something really good good came out of it. Let's close with a prayer. Shall we friends? You want to get up and hold hands in a circle? Lord Jesus Christ, you went through temptations, we learn in the Hebrews, in order to be able to help us when we go through temptations. We thank you, Lord. We have no idea what you suffered or what you went through, but we thank you for going through it for our sake. And we thank you for helping us when we're going through temptation. Remind us, Lord, send angels to help us. Remind us that the process is good Help us, Lord, to pray for our enemies. Help us to thank you. Help us to count it all joy when we go through diverse temptations. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, friends. Thank you, friends here in the room and friends online. God bless.